you can submit questions via the Q&A button on your screen. If your question has already been submitted, click the thumbs up icon. There will be links in the chat to purchase their books and donate to the festival. And before we get started, I want to give a heartfelt thank you to our sponsors. Recently, someone came into my shop and purchased a copy of Mark Wunderlich's new book, God of Nothingness, and I couldn't stop telling her how great the book was. The Beast of Bray Road, Cuthbert. She was in for a treat. When I stopped my enthusiastic and highly emotional praise, the woman said, you sound like you're in love with him. And I said, everyone who knows Mark Wunderlich is in love with him. The author of four incredible books, God of Nothingness, The Earth of Veils, Voluntary Servitude, and The Anchorage, recipient of the Lambda Literary Award, the Rilke Prize, the Wallace Stegner Fellowship, Fellowships from the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Mass Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Amy Lowell Trust, and many more. Wunderlich's work has been widely anthologized and translated. He directs the Bennington Writing Seminars graduate program, and he lives in a 300-year-old stone house in New York's Hudson Valley, often featured in his cottage core style Instagram, highly recommended. Dan Chasen is the author of six books, The Afterlife of Objects, History, One Kind of Everything, Poem and Person in Contemporary America, Where's the Moon, There's the Moon, Bicentennial, and most recently, The Math Campers. He's been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship for Poetry, a Whiting Award, as well as the Award in Literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Dan writes about other writers the way only an accomplished poet can. He's the sort of critic who takes up figures as different as Wanda Coleman and Henry Adams, thinks through their legacies, and opens the door for deeper, more magical rereadings. On Twitter, he doesn't shy away from controversial topics like UFOs and less controversially Robert Frost. He is the Lorraine C. Wang Professor of English at Wellesley College, and I can't help but wish I was a student in his class. This is a wish many of us who've read Dan's work share. I can't wait to hear him read today. So I'll end my introduction by saying what a joy it, hit, it is to have Dan Chasen and Mark Wunderlich reading together. Dan, take it away. Thank you, Rena. Thank you for that generous introduction. And um, it's just a joy to read with Mark, who's one of my favorite poets, and, uh, and to be with Rena, who's a, a, a great writer and just figure and friend of the arts. I still have not gotten to left bank books, but I can't wait to get there. I feel like I'm simultaneously in Wellesley, Massachusetts, Bennington, Vermont, your stone house, uh, Hanover, New Hampshire, uh, and the location of these poems that I'll read, which are mostly set in various places in Vermont. Um, I grew up in Burlington and um, spend a lot of time in the summer in the Northeast Kingdom. So this is sort of an all Vermont program. I'll begin reading um, by reading four brand new poems I wrote this summer. Um, and they're mainly, when they picture a landscape, they are picturing Caspian Lake in Greensboro. The first is called Loft. Hard night, I'm writing to calm myself. I'm in a prefab shed in the woods, as though buried alive. My face is an inch from the ceiling. I am trying to see a garden where my fears are, one flower at a time. But when my eyes close, I am the one covered in dirt. It goes on this way until the dawn, I write, though the dawn is hours, hours of this from now. The dawn will be like a friend arriving to drive me home, repacking the books I brought, the groceries I bought for my stay. Can you tell how much it helps me to say, not out loud, to the night or to you, whoever you are, those words together, dawn and friend? Even groceries, can you hear it, is a comfort. To say to the night, Send stars, please night, send stars. I am so frightened in the dark of the dark. My name is Dan and I am frightened. But the stars, they hid from their dad 
since they feared another night locked up inside his paranoia. They squint and count the clouds to calm their fears, star fears. Only this poem was my friend, but now it's gone and hit up ahead. Hard night, not nearly behind me. It's called By the Highway. <clears throat> this one is set in Wellesley, Mass., the only non-Vermont poem I'm gonna read. We live very near Route 9, where you can hear the traffic at night. So um, sometimes when I can't sleep, I start to think about the rhythm of the cars passing. By the highway. The cars at this hour roar somewhere. Bad night to have a pair of ears. Yet you have to admire the silence, the way it patiently yields to noise, as it always does. It accepts its nature is to be ruined again and again, to be ruined, then to remake itself, spruced up in time for new damage. Even the bees break it, the cicadas, even the breeze, so quiet it wouldn't wake a baby. But quiet versus silent, quiet destroys it. As the birds test one by one their skill for saying nothing, saying the same thing, nothing, over and over, the lunatics they are. As the real psycho, the hummingbird, his buzz, his body's byproduct, finds the nectar where it hides and up his tiny turkey baster siphons it, silence offers its own pretty mouth to be pissed in, degraded by a pin dropped, the damage to be addressed one day, but not now, when somebody's fetish requires it. This is called the forest of crickets. Hard night, you're in my breathing now. Come with me, since you have no choice since you've been in a way abducted. Every breath will demonstrate my power. We move through a forest of crickets. Their tiny bodies are elderly, arthritic. They sense the fall already moving in, who were children just yesterday, who were babies at dawn. They stiffen into clothespins. They cling to us. Each one wants to be the passenger who stays on past his destination. When I was a baby, I was put down in a bassinet hard by the airport. Jets arrived from Montreal all night over our house, where a runway is now. I despise time that can make a baby elderly, but aren't we lucky, you and I, that it takes longer than one summer. Night, can you help me to see it that way? But Night, who is ancient, looked on me with pity. He drew me to his breast like a baby. He nursed me, then he parted my hair. My life to him was one day, not even a summer. He met Annie, then he met our children. He watched as we fed them and parted their hair. Then it was night who emerged at dawn alone. I stayed behind in the forest of crickets. Here is a poem, uh, the title's a date, 9-11-21. It collapses many events from the summer into a single afternoon late summer afternoon on the lake. <clears throat> Over the tree line, the F-16s tore a hole in the sky's belly, then beeline toward the border, scraping their knuckles on J. Dragonflies were the evacuees. Pine pitch on the gray's float. I swam you out a load of metal chairs to where there is barely a signal. 
back on the dock in the toe of a shoe, your phone blew up like a hornet in need of a root canal. Only it was soldiers target practicing the empire's litter. A helicopter smashed its silly grin into the walls of a fortified compound. An assassin broadcast in thin air the news of his pulverized smile. The soldiers who came home were either suicidal or joined militias. They hated us more than the enemy. I dreamed our country was an elevator and we were all inside it, headed to a party on a roof deck, the lights shimmering, the catering. When a stranger, his face coming apart as he spoke, politely corrected me. No, this is a chimney, he said. His face had vanished now. We are smoke. So that's the start of something new. Um, four poems that I've written since I published this book last September, 2020. This is called The Math Campers. Um, I'm gonna read the title poem. It's a, sort of a linked sequence of rhyming short poems that are uh, set in the, the spring of 2019 when I was spending a lot of time in Vermont. I always try to figure out a way to spend as much time there as possible. Um, biding my time in this hellhole of Wellesley, Massachusetts while I wait to move back permanently. Um, and uh, I was able to get up there quite a bit. I was staying in, jo in Johnson at the Vermont Studio Center. So I wanna thank uh, the folks there. Um, I was up in Shelburne staying with my family. And then I was in Ripton teaching um, at the Breadloaf um, Environmental Writers Conference. So the poem is set in Vermont in the spring of 2019. Of course, we had no idea what was coming our way in the spring of 2019. So it feels even more ominous that it's set at that precipice. Uh, so uh, the, the poem has a little sort of a sort of a plot. It it's set at a geek camp in the summer, um, a camp for uh, academically enriched teens uh, who do math all summer. And they're so smart, these math obsessed teens, that they figure out formulas to stop time. Um, and their dream is that they can suspend time using math uh, so that the summer will never end. The math campers, Johnson, Shelburne, Ripton, Vermont, spring 2019. A mayfly born at the break of dawn dies when the sun goes down. A tortoise on an English lawn outlives his master's son's son's son. An ancient shark shakes off another century. Eerie and pristine, a fetal dolphin, a steamship and a sea anemone hang near her lifeless in the jellied ocean. This shark read over Milton's shoulder. In her extreme old age, she'll stare eye to eye into a, sky, into a skyscraper's foyer at guild amphibious corporate lawyers. The big night stares us down from space. We figured we would have more years. Annihilation in her prom dress greets her platonic date, despair. The, the black hole poses for her picture wearing a coronet of stars. A glacier, like a mountain only bigger, rides southward on its own shed tears. The deserts, parched for centuries, put on their snorkel gear. Scorpions write their obituaries. A cactus curtsies, then disappears. First in their class, the lichens sprawl like a rash or a blush on the face of a glacial erratic. A thunderclap deafens the marsh. This who's who comes from all over. A thawed field is a gold mine, an uproar over winterberries, chit chat along the power lines. 
What happens happened later, earlier. What happens earlier happened later. Now Frost is a, now Frost is a shallow passenger and biohazards ride the white-tailed deer. A beetle polishes its psychedelic shell. Fireflies splatter paint the night. The keeper's Honda's battery failed, parked near the cemetery gate. The cemetery overlooks the brook that blazed the highway's route. A hurricane washes out the highway. The cemetery seesaws on its bank then makes a break for the valley. Caskets line up for the slip and slide. A collarbone surfboards down the alley. Through the mudslide, we humans wade. In April, when the animals, in April, when the animals emerge, one by one from their holes, as from an advent calendar, to meet their awaiting identities, the mouse shimmies into her fur. The patch of blue expects its J. Hello, chipmunk, I am nervousness. In April, when the animals, in April, when the animals emerge, as from their office cubicles and the world wakes up enlarged. The spring held all its dividends, then shed them like confetti. Home in Vermont last weekend, I saw biofuel silos in the country, farmers returning to farming, asparagus, ramps, hemp, new ferns along the paths unfurling and robins waking sleepily. In middle school, if two boys want to kiss or hold hands, they can. Sixth graders learn sea level rise and march with their friends against guns. The hills say there's no single way to be up here this time of spring. Swimmable water in the valley, snow on Mount Mansfield still falling. In Greensboro, the sobs transform to Priuses, crustier than the ones in cities, driven by nurses and heiresses. Near Caspian Lake, one day, Chief Justice Rehnquist at his summer house swore Stephen Breyer in, only a part-time village clerk to witness. The circus camp patches its tents, the farm camp rouses on the hill, a goat behind a wire fence prepares to be clumsily milked. Hard problems at the math camp wait all winter for solutions. Engorged sums hibernate and dream of consolation. A raft dry docked through winter gets its feet wet and waits for July when the math campers arrive to stare at the stars and calculate the absolute value of 15 or how the summer might expand and prove eternal by division of days into hours, minutes, seconds. They're factoring love in suddenly and measuring how the stars in pairs create the sky's geometry and measuring their hearts spheres, skew lines of who they are and were. They know year after year you grow by comparing consecutive summers and expressing them in a ratio. Now in the interval between dodgeball and snack, the math campers back of the envelope equations they must solve to make the summer longer. They've meted out the summer with the math they've done so far. If they, want a, if they want a longer summer, oh, they'll have to practice harder. For every correct answer, one more hour, a furlough from the changing leaves. The daisies cheer from the bleachers and bumblebees gossip about love. Rationalists will say they failed. Fall came and bulldozed the bees. The daisies saw their heads explode and parents returned in their SUVs. The raft was dragged to a frozen lawn. The October stars withdrew into relations of their own. Ice strangled the bright yarrow. Black Adder has a restraining order against hyssop. Fucking Psycho arrived in a three-wheeler and did donuts in the meadow. An astronaut unzips his suit and masturbates to the turning earth, while distant galaxies ejaculate in acid trips of death and birth. First in his class, 
he spends the day on beating off and solo chess and writing in his diary, I gave up earth for fucking this. In Oregon on the TV mass plays all day for company, the wonders of the universe turn into drudgery. The universe first in its class elaborates its origin in the enormity of space. Light finds its lost horizon then vanishes in ecstasy. A dust cyclone undoes the sun and kills our opportunity. The little rover lost its friends. First in his class, he toiled hard on valedictory remarks for his own graduation. Quote, my battery is low, it's getting dark. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, that was that was terrific. I, I for some reason I'm I'm still thinking about the clumsily milked goat there in the in the, um, the the Vermont scene that you painted for us there with all of the with the biofuel and the and the hemp and the clumsily milked goat. That was all. Um, I, I felt like I was being transported. Um, even though we're we're here in in Vermont uh, virtually and electronically, um, I, in fact, I don't think I I think neither you me nor nor um, Rena are actually in the state of Vermont right now. I think we're all skirting the edges of it. I'm in upstate New York, and you're in Massachusetts. She's in uh, she's in New Hampshire. So anyway, there we are surrounded. We've got we've got it surrounded. Um, but wonderful to hear those poems, and it's so uh, delightful to um, share this virtual stage with you, um, and uh, and also to uh, be participating in the the Brattleboro uh, Lit Fest, which um, I've I've been to and admired, and uh, really really looked forward to to being part of. Um, I'm I'm sorry that we 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 couldn't be there. In a in a slightly moldy smelling tent with leaves damp leaves around us, you know that would be I I would I would love to be doing that, but here we are. Um, so thank you to the organizers and um, and to uh, Rena for in introducing us and everyone at the festival for making this happen. I'm going to read from this book, which is has been out for a little while. I've read a lot of these poems. Now it feels like a lot of times, um, but. Um, we're gonna do it one, one more time. So um, I'm gonna begin with the first poem in the book, which is um, a, a poem that uses my last name as the title. And when you have a last name, like Wonderlick, uh, there's, it's a sort of rough thing to sort of make it through about age 10 to about until you know, you're about 17, when you can kind of feel a little more self-possessed. Um, but it's one of those names, but people have often asked what it means. And the thing they say, does it mean wonderful? And in fact, that is not what it means. <laughs> That's not what it means at all. So this is a, a poem about the meaning of the last name. And so it is called Wonderlick. The name means odd. The name means queer. It can denote an odd fish. It suggests a queer chap. Sometimes it means capricious. It can also mean peevish. It's a synonym for singular. It is thought to be poetic. The Pied Piper of Hamlin was called ein wunderlicher Kautz, with his colorful clothing come to pipe the rats away. He drowned them in the vaser, or so the stories go. When the mayor withheld payment, he took the children and drowned them with the rats, or perhaps they went into the mountains or they moved to Transylvania. It is 100 years since our children left, says the crumbling book found in the church. That is what it means to be a wonderlick. The name means strange things happen to him. It means he can be disputatious. It means he sometimes wears peculiar garments to a party that as he aged, he became younger, less reliable, more in touch with what he would call his soul. You might not call it that yourself. It can mean quarrelsome. It can mean 
he prefers cats. It can mean he has a gnome tattooed near the hair underneath his arm. It means he loves Christmas like a simpleton. It means makes sushi out of spam. The name means curious, as in he bought a haunted house, and since weaning, he's not touched a woman's breast. It means he loves the color orange. It means he studied Dutch. It means pancakes for supper once again this week, and that he prefers to knit his own socks. The name means electric organ maestro. The name means famous botanical illustrator. It means the drunken tenor ass over tea kettle down a set of Viennese stairs. It is true there are few of us that we spread ourselves thin around the globe, find us making wine in Hungary, herding cattle in Namibia, captaining a ship somewhere off the Chilean coast. My wonderlicks steamed up the long brown Mississippi in a boat that put them and their peculiarities off in Wisconsin, where the name means a shady farm growing a crop of moss on a roof, an old man with a pistol in his pants, a child who didn't survive and occupies a pagan's ashy grave atop a limestone bluff, where the wind speaks his strange name or worse, voices recognition an attribution or a curse. Um, since it's sort of that season and I'm reading to you from my haunted house, this next poem is called Haunted House. I moved into the haunted house and gutted it to the bones. I wasn't alone then and worked there in a team. We evicted squirrels from their vast nutshell nest to fill dumpsters with 50 years of trash. I found three lit and ornamented trees in a pile of brush, uncovered secret drawings in a drawer. We tore up a floor to uncover a floor, sanded tulip poplar to a sheen. I let the others unhouse the rat snake muscled around the boiler pipes downstairs. They took it in a pail to Corlair's Creek, where it braided angrily away. I too slithered in the muddy crawl space, headlamp sputtering with sweat. When the house began to wake, the strangers began to arrive, driving their cars up our long drive to have a proper snoop. Uninvited, they told of Dutch Mary rocking in her scarf dead slaves buried in a hollow up the hill, the wellhead by the Indian trail where carriages stopped to let their long dead horses have a drink. If you think this scared me, you'd be wrong. I know a story meant to frighten when I hear one. Now I live here alone with the spirits I cannot see. I spend my days inside these rubble stone walls, cooking small meals and stoking logs into a smoking stove, while around me history stills to pictures in a frame, the same clouded view for old Dutch Mary waiting at the window once again. Uh, this next poem is a, an elegy. I wrote after the death of uh, my teacher and, and friend Lucy Brock Broido, um, who died in 2018. And I don't know, uh, there is a, a line in here in German. It's from the opera Eugene Onegin, and um, it's uh, Wohin bist du entschwunden, or where have you gone? Where have you disappeared? Gone is gone for Lucy Brock Broido. I was there at the edge of never, of once been, bearing the night's hide stretched across the night sky, awake with myself disappointing myself, armed, legged, and torsoed in the bed, my head occupied by enemy forces, mind not lost entire, but wandering off the marked path ill-advisedly. This march Lucy upped and died, and the funny show of her smoky-throated world began to fade. I didn't know how much of me was made by her, 
But now I know that this spooky art in which we staple a thing to our best sketch of a thing was done under her direction. And here I am at 4 a.m. scratching a green pen over a notebook bound in red leather in October. It's too warm for a fire. She'd hate that. And the cats appear here only as apparitions I glimpse sleeping in a chair. Then, vohin bist du entschwunden, I wise up. No, their likenesses are only inked on my shoulder's skin, their chipped ash poured in twin cinerary jars downstairs. Gone is gone, said the goose to the shrunken boy in the mean-spirited Swedish children's book I love. I shouldn't be writing this at this age or any other. She mothered a part of me that needed that, lit a spirit lantern to spin shapes inside my obituary head, even though I'm nearly certain now she's dead. Um, this next poem is, uh, it's a little, it's, I think it's both comedic, but unfortunately it's also mean spirited. Um, so it's the smallest part of me that's writing, writing this poem. It's about, it's a, it uses the, uh, the story of the prodigal son and it's called the prodigal. And it begins with the line, a certain man had two sons, Luke 15, 11. I am the one who stayed did as he was told, remained behind with his straight A's goody two-shoes Mr. Butter wouldn't melt. I felt all the resentment stockpiled by anyone that clean and good with my organized calendar, color-coded tabs, balanced checkbook, money in the bank. Unthanked, I took the old women to church, lurched through the fellowship hall to clean up after volunteer lunch. It was I who put down the incontinent dog, drove the old man to Rochester through sleet, then went to work, managed the accounts, sold off the machinery and got a good price. It must be nice to be so very absent, not return the call, spending fall and winter doing as he pleased, dancing high and costumed in the desert dust, burning man's skeleton ablaze. Meanwhile, on planet Earth, I got the leaves cleaned up and prepared to shovel snow. Here I go back to Lake Winona Manor to mush through another hour of gun smoke and soft brown food, sipping a plastic cup of milk while willing my bruise colored mood away. How easy it was to stay, to suffer nobly and alone, how simple to be useful to the infirm, keep the whispered vigil, pat the dying man's hand, a relief to wake worried about the crop, spend the morning oiling tools, sweeping up the shop, while he spends the bail money I sent parachuting from a plane. For years, we didn't hear from him, though he cashed the birthday check while we imagined him as some wreck sleeping on a bus. We, all of us, and so he returned, welcomed warily by our dwindling clan to shake his dying dad's hand. Here I stand in the background, frying the fatted calf in grease, while he weeps for what was lost for himself and with evident enviable release. Um, this one's a little, it's maybe a little, another Gothic. How about another Gothic, <laughs> seasonal Gothic poem? Um, this one in, um, written in sort of quasi-heroic couplets. <laughs> so there's that, I'll, I'll read this. Uh, Rena mentioned it, so I'll, I'll toss this in. It's, it's called Cuthbert. Um, Cuthbert was an actual, just so you know, it's Cuthbert was a, a, a lamb who I was in my possession, Cuthbert. I had a lamb and named him Cuthbert. Cuthbert was what I named my little lamb. I fed him oats and I fed him corn. I fed him on the clover flush with spring. I pet and patted Cuthbert every day, fed him on the brightest summer hay. Cuthbert, little Cuthbert, how he grew. 
I knew then what Cuthbert didn't know. I trained Cuthbert daily for the fair, led him with a gleaming halter in a ring. Spring drew on and dully led to summer. My market lamb was now, my little lamb was now a market weather. We took him in a trailer to the show. He bedded down in bright sawdust in his stall. I blackened Cuthbert's pretty cloven hooves. I carded Cuthbert's haunches with a comb. I oiled his black muzzle until it shone and the day came to take him to the ring. The livestock judge opened Cuthbert's mouth, examined Cuthbert's single row of teeth. He patted hands on Cuthbert's meaty loin, moved us into a single showman's line. The judge returned, walked off, came back again, pulled us from the lineup and then said, this market weather was the finest in his class. That night, I put Cuthbert on the block the auctioneer sang the money from the crowd. Cuthbert stood tensely and I was proud. A banker bid the highest for the lamb. I led him through the sawdust to his pen, fed him a laudatory meal in his pan. By morning, the stalls stood empty in a row and we children were invited to the show of the carcasses of market lambs and hogs of Hereford steers trained docile as a dog, the bodies stripped of hides hung on their hooks. We filed past them, casting furtive looks, the carcasses bright surface white with fat, the room chilled cold enough so that the wheat meat we grew stayed incorruptible and fresh. We exited the abattoir's cold light and in the concrete hallway, was the sight of heads struck dumb and staring by the door under plastic sheeting on the floor to be taken to the mink farm, we were told, for every precious portion had been sold. His head looked out at nothing he could see. Cuthbert, little Cuthbert, you have nothing left for me. And um, let me just check my time here. Maybe one more before the Q&A. Let's see. Um, how about, oh, I'll read a poem. This one is, um, this, one's, this one's for Dan because I know he spent time in the same place, actually. This, I wrote this. It's the one poem that I wrote seated at James Merrill's desk at the Merrill House in Stonington, Connecticut. I actually was totally spooked and freaked out about sitting at that desk. I could not do it. And the smell of like decaying books, like these books, like it would warm up and you did that. I just thought this, it's way too much to be here in this place where all of these spirits have been channeled. And so I was there and I was reading, um, I was reading C.D. Wright and she has this marvelous poem called Our Dust. And it was, there was something about this dusty inner chamber of this place, which is both a kind of shrine to this great poet. It's also a place where poets are invited to come and write, but it also felt to me like a dead library and that this, nothing is really being added to this anymore. It's a kind of, it's being held in time and space in this way as a something of a museum into which a few people are invited. And so it, it was a very strange experience. And I was reading this poem by, by C.D. Wright, which I love, which is a poem that's written posthumous. It's the voice in it is posthumous. It's a voice that's sort of coming from the other side. And I thought a lot about what it was to write that kind of poem and how many of them there are. You know, there's, there's, I think of like Epistle to be Left in the Earth by, um, I think of, I think of so many of Dickinson's strange poems in which she's narrating from inside the tomb, from inside the carriage on the way to death, the, the speaker and I heard a fly buzz who's speaking after dying. I think of Whitman standing on 
on the on the pier of the ferry watching the future walk toward him as he's sort of addressing them and that that is this way of being sort of posthumous and I, of course i think of the voice in the duino elegies which seems to be sort of narrated from the other side in this way he's kind of speaking in a way to someone who has as if he is someone who has already gone um and then I thought of those sort of seances, of course, that had taken place in, in, in that room in Stonington, Connecticut by, by James Merrill. And so this is a poem in which I decided to take on the posthumous voice. It ends the book and I wrote it there that morning and, and it's called To Whom It May Concern. In the Polaroid in the drawer of the house, the other relatives picked over. I'm the blur in the background, mop of silvery hair. The rasp of the ash pan when you empty the stove is a bit like my voice, stuck in the chimney like a nest. You won't have to know how I procrastinated of my abiding fear of snakes or how I gave terrible presents when I bothered to give them at all. I was told by a psychic to remember the unloved dead, and so I did, but not in a way they would like, recalling how they got ugly when they drank or stole the loose change from the laundry when they thought nobody saw. I spent years writing off, writing my last letters, writing off the debt of a cold bed, pretending I was busy when really I was home, pinned to the couch by a cat. For money, I did many things, trapped muskrats, forged thank you notes, let men pet me while I danced. Mostly I pay, played the role of someone who cared, tilted in my chair and trying to appear engaged, the preoccupied uncle you weren't quite sure you liked. That's me smoking in the Winnebago, leaving the sink clean of hair. I'm there deadheading the rhubarb nobody bothers to pick and my worthless collections, rag rugs, concrete gnomes were most likely put out in the trash. Sometimes I lied when I was bored. I wanted you to know what I knew, though I eventually gave that up, preferring to make you laugh. This life I led was mostly private and hours were spent sweeping bat guano from a crumbling set of stairs. Nobody knew the half of it and nobody seemed to care. I foresaw how neglected the town cemetery became glimpsed in a vision the rusted fence that let in the deer. They stripped the bark from the junipers that eventually came down in a storm. I was in that storm, blown out across the ice toward Arcadia. That's a town in Wisconsin and not some name for paradise. So thanks everyone. So, um, we may have some, if Rena does not reappear, it means we may have some technical difficulty with her, in which case, Dan, you and I are going to manage any questions that we have. We're going to moderate. Are we going to co-moderate? We're going to co-moderate. All right. You're, I'm a moderate. Oh, she's back. Rena's back. Hey, Rena. <laughs> Hi. That was magnificent, Mark. Well, thank you. Incredible. What a delight to share, share this this venue with you, Dan. Yeah, likewise. So it looks like we have a question from Sherry. Um, and I, it looks like also it's addressed to both of you. Our Sherry? Yes, our Sherry. Hi, Sherry. When you think of autumn, is there a specific poem that always comes to mind? Dan, I bet I, we might even share the same, have the same poem in mind. On three, one, two, three, two autumn. autumn. Yes. <laughs> John, John Keats is two autumn. Maybe, maybe like a perfect poem in the English language. Yeah, it's extraordinary. It's so moving. Um, the word conspiring is the first one that gets me every time. Just incredible. And the way he starts, you know, I was I was just um, thinking about this poem, and and uh, you know, there's the three sections of it, and so he begins with the idea of this all of this like fructification, you know, the, the sort of oozing, the sweetening of the season, you know, and 
and then you go to the the mill you know it's this uh, this place of this sort of the the millers like the grinding the last and the gleaners and you know things like that and then the final one where he talks, invokes the lambs. It's like the lambs on Healy Bourne. And I always have to point out to my students, we think about Cuthbert here, but there's the migrating birds kind of twittering over. It's like this emptying of the landscape as it happens from like the full fruit to the, the place where the birds are flying. Well, what's the last part of the harvest, you know, is when you yeah. slaughter the animals. Right, right. And because it's finally cold enough to do that. And so they're done. And I point this out to the students that this is, you know, there's this progression that takes place. And of course, he knows he's dying. Yeah. He writes this poem, the guy's like yeah. 20. Really. I know, really to steady himself, you know, the rhythms are so steadying, I find. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend, that's so touching, bosom friend of the maturing sun. You know, there are two teenagers growing up together, it seems like to me. Um, and, um, and I was just thinking last night as we were sitting on our front porch and listening to the crickets and cicadas and, and not cicadas, crickets and katydids and other things. I mean, the first frost is a, it's an extinction event. It's devastating. All of those voices and that chorus just wiped out, you know, in a, in a single night, so. And in this part of the world, I was just thinking about it. We spend half the half the year is cold, I know. half the warm. Your half the year is sort of getting out of it. I was just, <laughs> you know, I'm just stacking my sixth cord of firewood <laughs> yesterday, and I'm like, oh my it's god, it's like bracing yourself for this this thing yeah. that's about to happen. Yeah. So that poem is so moving to me, and I love it so much. And it's just the just like the best invocation of the of the season. I like it better the, the older I get, Mark. You know, I, I, I used to acknowledge its great dignity and, and solemnity, but like the other roads a little better maybe. But um, there's no contender for me now. That's the greatest of Keats's poems, I think. Yeah, it mm -hmm. is. I, I, I go back to it often, I think. Yeah, I do too. Um, what was I getting? Oh, there's an... In the Merrill volume, the uh, in the letters volume that Stephen Yenser just put out, there's a, I don't know if you saw that, but there's a, a letter where he's describing being in that graveyard in Stonington. Oh, yeah. And it was one of the, uh, the, the so-called stone women that he was close friends with, these elderly women that he was buddies with. And it was at her funeral, her burial, uh, where he read that poem um, mm -hmm. and talked about in the letter, the personal associations he had with his friend in almost every phrase. It's very beautiful, yeah. I love that cemetery. I wrote, I ended up writing a poem about, uh, there was a grave for someone in that cemetery called Free Love Discarn, or Free Love Hancock is her name. No and way. I was, what, I, I, so I had to write a poem about Free Love Hancock. Yeah, you just had to, you just had to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a couple other questions here. I think there's one for each of us. Okay. Oh, um, I see. Q and A. There they are. Um, and I definitely want to hear Dan talk about UFOs. <laughs> now, how about we start with that one? So the uh -huh. question for Dan is: Have any UFOs made their way into your poems yet? Well, that poem I read ends up in space with the masturbating astronaut, um, and so not UFOs maybe specifically, but a point of view upon all of this that uh, is kind of bleakly and also gleefully apocalyptic um, has, has entered my work recently. Um, I was in that poem figuring out a way to write about climate change without I don't know, I, I'm not great at solemnity sometimes. I, I, I need to be sort of sarcastic, I think, sometimes. So I, I, I had to choose a point of view that was just, oh, fuck it all. Let's just, it's, this earth is gonna be just gone. So let's just blast off into space and play chess and jerk off, you know? So anyway, that, that so I don't know, but I have not been able to write about UFOs so far, but it's on my mind. It's on my yeah. mind. It's a big summer for UFOs, as, as you all know. And so the, the question for Mark in the Q&A um, says, Mark, I love Cuthbert. If I remember right, you come from a farm background. 
Is Cuthbert a real lamb you raised or just a tongue in cheek poem about that life? Oh, no, it's a documentary. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry to report. No, Cuthbert was indeed one of the lambs that I, I, I raised. I, I had this, um, I, I, I both named them, often named them after kind of biblical names that I've sort of biblical names, but also the names of like the peculiar old names in the rural Midwest of people like you foreseen and Praxidia and, you know, uh, et cetera. So they, they often had names like that. Yes. Yeah, so I, every year for the fair, I would raise a lamb, um, a market lamb. And then it was like the, the, the county fair. It's like, when I talk about these things, it truly, I know it was another century. It was the 20th century, but really it was the late 19th century when I was like growing up. I sometimes think like, see, I like had a trap line to like make extra money. Like, you know, these things, it's truly, this is what it was to grow up in like these pockets of rural America. It's like, the, you know, the annual event for the year, like the big summer social event was the county fair. And you like prepared for it all year, but you know, kids growing up on farms in these places, like you're so isolated. Like you're isolate all summer long. You're just like stuck on this farm with your siblings and your family in the end. You know, it's, this is what it was to grow up during that time. It's like, there wasn't, until you're 16 or actually 14, you can get a farm license, but until you're like 14 and can get a, you know, be able to drive somewhere, you're just stuck. You know, like nobody was too concerned about like the, you know, but you were given all these things to do in preparation for the fair. So indeed I would raise a land, did all kinds of things for, for the fair. You know, we showed hogs and poultry and, you know, like all these things, but the lamb was the big one because we had a, a, a sizable flock of sheep. And so would raise this lamb and then you take it to the fair and show it, but then there's an auction. Um, and it's a big deal because like business people, you know, like the bank owner and the owner of the feed mill and, you know, these people from the all around the county would come and bid on 4-H kids animals. But then they, as a service to the people who bought them, they would take them across the street from the fairgrounds to the, to the slaughterhouse. And they would process the animal for you and then you could just go pick up the, you know, the frozen you know, meat from once you bought this animal. So it was a kind of one, one shot deal. They paid much more than market price to the 4-H kids. So you would make, you would, you would get cash, right? So this is why everyone wanted to do it. And so you would have this thing, but there also was the carcass show because the slaughterhouse was across the street. The animals were then taken over there if they were sold and then they were slaughtered and then they would show the carcasses and a judge would come in and reevaluate all of the hanging meat to you know rate the quality of these carcasses and the kids we were taken to the carcass show so you know I think I probably went to the carcass show and you know I don't know I think I was able to show a lamb when I was like 10 I think that was probably old enough so it was about 10 and that was done it was not the first you know we slaughtered animals at home something that I saw but it was really one that had been given to me I knew it wasn't a pet but it's hard for it to actually not be a pet the, the thing about like rural life in that way is that you're asked to, you're asked to participate in a certain kind of reality, acknowledge a certain kind of reality about things, but there's also a kind of brutality that you're expected to participate in as well, that you are, are that everyone is involved in, in that sort of situation. And part of the thing, like what the point of a whole, of a supermarket is to separate people from that process. The point of a farm is to deliver the things into that process and you can't escape it if you're someone who like works in agriculture. That's the difference. You know, the whole idea of the supermarket is to detach people from the production of food, to make it look like something that was not a living, a living animal. Oh yes, there's, there's that. That's, that's a, a kind of part of, of what it is. So yes, Cuthbert, real. I love that. I love that. So I don't see any more questions in the Q&A or anything in the chat. So I think this might be a good time to wrap up. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Rena. I think the cuckoo sort of sounded us <laughs> out. Let us know our time was up here. Um, thank you, everybody at the festival. Dan, what a, what a treat it was to, um, to, to spend uh, time here with you this afternoon. It was mine. I can't wait to see you in person again.
Great. Both of you guys. Mm -hmm. Likewise. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Bye.